So omega here. Sometimes it's called the frequency factor. Sometimes it's called the angular frequency. So things of this sort. In this case, it turns out it's equal to 2 pi times the actual frequency. So my first question is, what is frequency? So it's measured in hertz. What's a hertz? How often something occurs. What is a hertz, though? Mm, don't go there. What, is, what does hertz actually mean? It's anything per second. Anything you're measuring per second, how frequently occurs per second. That's what a hertz is. So if I come over here and I start punching Albert five times per second, hertz, don't it? Sweet. That would be five hertz, though. So because it's five whatevers, in this case, punches per second. So it's whatever you want to talk about. Five oscillations back and forth, you know, one full oscillation of the spring. So, so or in this case, one full swing from start to finish, back to where we started, you know, it's how many of those we do per second. That's what frequency is. And if I want to turn that into an angular frequency, so we got to scale it by a factor of 2 pi. So just like when you're, you know, scaling, you know, what's the, what's a full circle in radians? 2 pi. But what's a full circle in distance? 2 pi r. And so the difference between, you know, your circumference so as well as then your, just your regular distance all the way around is a factor of 2 pi. So, and that's where we're scaling it by 2 pi here, just uh, dealing with this oscillatory motion. It's not necessarily circular motion, but it is repetitive motion, just like circular motion is repetitive motion. OK, so a couple other things. If I was hitting Albert five times per second, then how long was one punch? A fifth of a second, 0.2 seconds. We call that, in this case, the period. And so the period, t, is just equal to 1 over the frequency. Your frequency I was hitting you with, Albert, was 5 per second, 5 hertz. And so the period was 1 fifth of a second. So this kind of just follows right through. And so we're just seeing a lot of variables that are equal to each other. So if you notice, omega, frequency, and period are all related. If you know any one of those three, you can find the other two. Cool. Let's see where else we want to go with this. Uh, we want to take this one other place. I'm not actually going to show you how we derive it. I'm just going to give it to you. So for your spring, omega is equal to the square root of k over m. So k here, what does that stand for? Spring constant, what is m? Mass at the end of the spring. Whatever mass is spent at the end of the spring, that is what goes there. And that's what your frequency factor here, or your angular frequency, depends on. It depends on the spring constant and the mass. Change either one of those, you're going to end up changing that frequency factor, that angular frequency. Now for the pendulum, on the other hand, pendulum depends on the value of gravity. So if you were on you know, the moon instead of on Earth, you'd have a different value of gravity, and that would affect that angular frequency. But it also depends on how long the pendulum is. The longer the pendulum, the smaller the angular frequency. So why the root? And again, I said I wasn't going to derive these. But if you look, <coughs> so it comes from your acceleration. When is acceleration at a maximum? So at the extremes, right? And what is the value of the acceleration according to the formula? A omega squared. But what is that equal to? So well, if you look, according to f equals ma, first off, so a would equal f over m, right? Well, at this point of the extremes, let's say for the spring, what's the force? Well, it's Hooke's law, which I erased. f equals negative kx, right? And so in that case, you'd have A equals negative kx over m. So, but what's A equal to? Well, A at the extremes would equal A times omega squared. And so once you plug some things in here, you'll find out you have omega squared. And to get omega, you take the square root. And that's where it's coming from. So, but if you do some plugging and chugging in there, you'll totally get there. So, but I'm not going to go there. The result is what's important. And so you often hear people say, 
whack em wiggle. So as ways of just memorizing your lovely omegas, depending on if you're talking about the spring or the pendulum. Notice one important thing here. Your pendulum, the angular frequency does not depend on what? So it doesn't depend on angle. What else does it not depend on? The mass of the bob hanging at the end of that. It doesn't matter at all. And notice, that makes sense though. If I were in outer space, so or let's just say I was in a vacuum, a giant vacuum, and I dropped a bowling ball and a feather, which one's gonna hit the ground first? They both hit the ground at the same time. Because as long as there's no air, then there's no air resistance. And we'll see that all objects are affected by gravity with 9.8 meters per second squared on Earth, right? And so they're going to both hit the ground at exactly the same time. And so it doesn't matter what mass is hanging at the end of this bob either in the same way, because it's gravity that's making it go back and forth. And so its mass is irrelevant. Gravity unlocks on all objects with the same acceleration due to gravity. Cool. Sweet. So these are just some things to keep in mind. Let's look at some of the types of calculations we might see with this lovely stuff. All right, number 11. A spring with a mass, with a one kilogram mass attached, obeying simple harmonic motion, follows the following equation of motion. So what is the velocity of the mass as it passes through the equilibrium position? What is the frequency and period of oscillation? Okay, so we got some things to figure out here. So first question is, what is the velocity as it passes through the equilibrium position? Well, first thing I remember is that as a spring oscillates, when it passes through the equilibrium position, what's special about the velocity there? It's at a maximum. And what was the maximum velocity we might actually have? Yeah, absolute value of A omega. So in this case, let's match this up. What's A? 100 centimeters. What's omega? Five. Sweet. So then what's Vmax? What's that? Well, I'm going to put it in SI units, just because I want to put it in SI units. So there are five meters times, that's my A, oh, I'm sorry, actually, that's just one meter, my bad, and then times five. And technically, to be an angular frequency, it has units of radians per second, or whatever per second, oscillations per second, whatever. So, and technically, I call it radians, but it's just kind of like a, I like to think of it as a made up unit. It's five whatevers per second. So what's a meter times a whatever per second? Well, it's meters per second. It's not really a unit in the end result here. And so we get five meters per second is the velocity at the equilibrium position, the max velocity it's ever gonna have. Okay, a couple other questions tacked onto the end of that thing is, what are the frequency and period of oscillation? Well, how am I gonna get the F, the frequency? From omega, and what's F equal to in terms of omega? Good. F equals omega over 2 pi. Cool. Omega was again 5. And so we end up with, I'll just leave it as 5 over 2 pi, actually. I won't even simplify it further. We could, if I was trying to get some exact numerical answer, I'd plug in 3.14 whatever for pi and yada yada. So, Muhammad, then what's the period? Good. So T equals 1 over F. So you look so different today, Muhammad. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. No worries, Amanda. <laughs> so, and so I'll just invert F and get 2 pi over 5. I was actually trying to be funny, not make you feel bad. So <laughs> no worries. <laughs> cool. And so those are all the kind of things we can find just by having the simple equation of motion of something undergoing simple harmonic motion. Cool. Um, number 12 says, a mass on a spring undergoing simple harmonic motion 
has another mass glued to the original mass while in motion, effectively quadrupling the mass. What is the effect on the period of oscillation? So if we look, we have this thing that's oscillating back and forth, and as it's going, we kind of put some glue maybe on the bottom of another mass and just set it right on top as it's going back and forth and just dropped it right on there. So it glued to that mass. And because now I've got this bigger mass, what do you think that's going to do? It's going to slow it down. What do you think that does to the period of oscillation then? Yeah, it makes the period longer because we've slowed it down. So if we look though, so we want more of a numerical answer to this thing. So in this case, again, it says a mass on a spring undergoing simple harmonic motion has another mass glued to the original mass while in motion, effectively quadrupling the mass. So we've put a mass three times bigger than it on top of it. That way the total mass is now four times bigger total than the original. And again, the question is, what is the effect on the period of oscillation? So in this case, where does mass, this four times bigger mass, going to come into play? It's going to change the angular frequency. And if this mass on bottom is four times bigger, what does that do to this angular frequency? So it decreases it by a factor of two, exactly. Because it's going to be, in this case, if the bottom is four times bigger, I'm sorry, yeah, four times bigger, then essentially I'm going to have the square root, the same k value, so, and it's k over 4m. But notice that's the same thing as the square root of 1 fourth times k over m. And what's the square root of 1 fourth? Half. And so now I find out that it's 1 half of the original square root of k over m. It's equal to 1 half of the original omega. So the original angular frequency. OK, now I've got to relate this to period. If my angular frequency is only half as big, what's true about the regular frequency? It's only half as big. And what's, again, the period equal to? 1 over frequency. And so if my, other, my regular frequency is only half as big, then my period is twice as long. And that's the key. That's the reasoning down the chain we want to kind of make. Cool. So it just made the period twice as long. So if we look at problem number 13, problem number 13 says, if the length of a pendulum is increased by a factor of 10 and the mass of the bob is doubled, what will be the effect on the frequency of oscillation? Now I'm trying to trick you, and how am I trying to trick you here? Mass doesn't matter. And so it said the mass of the bob was doubled, and that doesn't change anything. That doesn't affect anything. And in fact, for our pendulum, we see it doesn't affect the, the angular frequency here at all. So, but in this case, what did we change that does affect our motion? The length of the pendulum. And we made the pendulum 10 times longer. Is that going to make our angular frequency go up or down? It's going to make it smaller, because I'm dividing here by 10. But then I've got to take the square root. And so in this case, it's not 10 times smaller. It's the square root of 10 times smaller. What's the square root of 10? And so we see that our new omega, which I'm going to call omega final here, is equal to the original omega divided by 3.16. Everybody cool with that? So you could follow the same kind of line of reasoning, line of logic out, to find out that our, our new omega is equal to the original omega divided by 3.16. 3.16 times smaller. OK. If it's 3.16 times smaller here, the question is, what will be the effect on the frequency? Well, if omega is 3.16 times smaller, then what's going to be true about the frequency? It's also 3.16 times smaller. They're directly proportional. You lower one, you lower the other by the same degree. And so in this case, my frequency is 3.16 times smaller, or just a little bit less than one-third of its original value. Cool. And that's all the question was really asking. <laughs>